backstage and someone said, hey, are you nervous? You speak a lot. It's a really good chance you to ruin your life. And I said, <laughs> so well, now I am. Uh, so I'm confident that today in the room, as I look at you guys, that there's employees, managers, and entrepreneurs who intend to make a positive impact on the people you work for or work with, to be businessmen and women of integrity and truth, and to make this place a little bit better than when we found it. So I'm going to talk more about this, but first, I'm going to walk you guys through an exercise. I'm going to show you guys seven company logos, and I want you to raise your hand. So I'm going to need some lights out here. I want you to raise your hand if you believe these companies value people over profit. And I want you to raise your fist if you believe they value profit over people. We're going to go quick. Here we go. Come on. Quick, quick, quick. There we go. Ah, a little disagreement there. <laughs> Chick-fil-A. Depends on where you're from, right? <laughs> Apple. <laughs> McDonald's. A little anger. Ford. Whole Foods. All you hippies out here, right? <laughs> Bank of America. Oh, some overdraft fees. That's what's going on. So is it a company's destiny to just end up with a room full of fists just a, a few years down the road or a few decades down the road? You know, the answer is no, because have bad companies always been bad? Have hated companies always been hated? It's because many of you guys would have actually changed your answers based on one thing, the year that I asked you guys that question. Has Bank of America always been perceived to value profit over people? No. They were a great startup in the late 1890s, <laughs> as was McDonald's in the 1950s, right? So how did... Bank of America go from one of the most people-centric banks of the 1920s to becoming, you know, being the, the monster behind the housing crisis in 2008? How did McDonald's go from the quality king of the 1950s to the poster child for the obesity epidemic in America today? Ray Kroc, probably, you know, the founder of McDonald's, probably wasn't sitting there going, man, I hope that one day a room full of fists is declaring that I value profit over people. That's probably not the case, right? So, we know that companies become things they never intended to be. The same was true for the company my father worked for when I was just a little boy. This is me. Uh, 1990, I was about five years old right here. I grew up in Southern California, just right outside LA. My dad worked for General Electric. And uh, he would come home at 3.30 in the afternoon, and he would park his truck in the driveway, he'd set his keys down in this little entry uh, to our house, and he'd say, Dale, today I'm wearing the golden handcuffs. And at five years old, I have no idea what the heck he's talking about, right? Um, as I grow older, though, I realize that he's saying, Dale, I have a job that's too good to leave. And uh, he, had a, he had a career that he felt stuck. You know, he wasn't able to fulfill his purposes. He didn't have the opportunities. He actually told me once that he almost felt like a prison. He had a company that cared for him as a part of a machine, but not as a person. He wanted something better for me. So he'd wake up at like five in the morning and go get cans and bottles, not because you know, we needed the money, but he wanted to teach me that I could make money on my own. And this trend continued on until I was a little bit older, and I was selling lemonade. Get outside, sell some lemonade. You have the best drink on the block. And uh, this trend also continued into junior high. So I'd go and I'd pick up airhead taffy. You remember those? You'd shake them down a little ball. And I'd get the airheads, and I would put them in my backpack, and I would take them to school, and I'd, I'd sell them 25 cents to the kids that I liked and 75 cents to the kids that I didn't like. <laughs> and um, this experience, I realized that my dad, that statement that he made to me, it really wasn't a statement at all. It was an invitation. It was an invitation to value people over profit, right? It was this invitation to break the system, okay? It was an invitation to break those golden handcuffs. It was an invitation to be this entrepreneur. And I took that invitation seriously. By the time I was 25, I produced five companies, producing $5 million a year. And uh, I was searching for meaning. And I was putting six figures in my pocket, but then I hit a wall. I realized that success 
wasn't fixing me. I realized that pursuing just profit was never going to fulfill the longings of the human heart. And I wanted to figure out how I could blend purpose and profit. What did that look like? I wanted to start asking the harder questions, and I wanted to flip capitalism upside down. And it ended in three simple words. People over profit. But as I said, I, 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 wanted to, I didn't want to just talk about it. I wanted to actually do something. I didn't want to be another idea that sat in my GoDaddy graveyard of the things that I'd never pursue, <laughs> right? And um, it was this vision, it was this philosophy that helped me start my company, Sevenly, in 2011. And uh, it was this chance that I got to put the people over profit philosophies to practice, to build a multi-million dollar company where we would give seven dollar donations away to charities. We built uh, this incredible brand and, and supported charities across the globe. And uh, as we were growing, we became one of the most well-known companies in our industry. And I started asking some questions. I'm like, why is this working? We're giving so much money away. Why is my for-profit company working so well? I started asking these questions, and I was wondering, is the, is the floor going to fall from beneath us? Is this a fleeting trend? And after analyzing, I realized that, that it wasn't. There was actually a shift towards good in our economy. I saw companies like Tom Shoes and Warby Parker and Whole Foods and, you know, uh, In-N-Out Burger, Trailblaze, a marketplace in comparison to their competitors. See, but even though we had the shift towards good in our economy, there are still some examples of companies or industries that I believe were still valuing profit over people. I think you guys can relate with a few of them. Uh, so credit card companies who force, are so, they're so focused on profit, right, that they actually, the government has to create laws to protect consumers from deception. Food companies that have increased efficiency at the cost of quality to create a product that they wouldn't even feed to their own families. Executives that have chosen a level of greed and immorality that's hurt the thousands of employees and customers that they vowed to care for. And cell phone companies. And uh, <laughs> cable companies that have forced multi-year contracts on their customers rather than just creating a product that people would stand behind on their own. You see, but even in the face of these bad companies, there is a bright counterpart of companies that's arising from this downward trend in capitalism. A counterpart that says, we're going to pay more to offer honesty and integrity to our customers. A counterpart that's contract free, a counterpart that's organic, a counterpart that says, we don't just care about our customers, we care about our world. Many of you guys have called this counterpart conscious capitalism or social good or philanthropic capitalism. But you know, why is it, even on the onslaught of these great companies coming on the scene, why is it we still see that some of these companies that started out great, just a few years to decades later, end bad? What happened there? And that's what we're here to talk about today. Organizations function in four distinct eras of time. And why is this important to you guys? Because if we're going to create the economy that values people, the environment, and gives the future generation something to look forward to, then we must understand before we can create change. Okay, I could use the medical industry or the finance industry. I'm going to use the automotive industry and the company Ford, because everybody here knows who Ford is probably, and, and we all probably drive a car. So, the first era of organizational behavior is the honest, exceptional, and moral era. This is people over profit. And all companies start here. This is when companies are captivated by their values. When craftsmanship, quality, authenticity, and integrity are at the core of the company. This is Ford. 1914, when they became the first company in the world to offer a 40-hour work week. In the face of their competitors offering an 80 to 100 hour work week, Henry Ford said, no, we're not going to do that. We're actually going to work with the unions. We're going to you know, provide great pay, give you benefits, and offer you a sustainable work week. It's impressive. But as companies grow, they make subtle exceptions and deviations to make room for the growth, which leads these companies often to the efficient, satisfactory, and ethical era. This is people and profit. And this is when companies are addicted to more and they start confusing being bigger with being better. This is when assembly lines, outsourcing, bulk manufacturing, speed move to the core of the company. This is Ford, 1955, with the rollout of the Mustang, the Cobra, and the Shelby. They became one of the you know, greatest manufacturers of automobiles in the entire country. See, but fueled by greed and a little bit of a lack of control of their growth, 
companies typically slip a little bit lower, <clears throat> which moves them to the deceptive, unacceptable, and unethical era. This is profit over people. This is when companies are destroyed by greed. When planned obsolescence, shortcuts, greed, layoffs, disproportionate wealth all move to the core of the company. This is when founding values are preached, but not practiced. And when turning a buck goes from healthy to harmful. This is Ford, 1971, with the rollout of the Ford Pinto. <laughs> the car that claimed somewhere around 900 lives, some of which actually burned alive in that car. And Ford released a statement just a few years later that said, we knew about the design flaw. Uh, we thought it was cheaper to pay for the lawsuits than to fix the car. Now, when Henry Ford of 1914 made that decision, probably not. Would they have been able to stay in business if they made that decision? Probably not. Something had changed in the philosophy. But remember that customers won't stand for this for long. Companies must right their wrongs, recognize their failures, and start the long process of apologizing to its customers, which leads many companies into the apologetic, rectifying, and highlighting of truth era. This is where we are now, at least many companies are, post-2008 recession, trying to earn back trust from consumers. It's when companies are making a revolutionary act, okay, when, when transparency, the exposing of lies, the redomestication of product, and the resurrection of core values that once were moved back to the core of the company. This is Ford, 2009 post-government bailout for the automotive industry, and they go, hey, we're not going to take the money. We're going to do this with integrity. And they rolled out 10-year, 100,000-mile warranties, things that that company has, hasn't done in years, if ever. It was a really incredible version of Ford that we hadn't seen in decades. And they're actually not going to get worse, but better, as many companies are moving back from the apologetic era back into the honest era. But it leaves us with this massive question. Are companies just subject to this pattern? Are we a victim of this cycle? See, people over profit leaders can break the system, right? We can create the capitalism we want. We're not going to let this past capitalism dictate the future of our capitalism. And it's actually so much easier than it seems. Because people over profit leaders, you know, most business people, actually I'll start with this, most business people are, are going, they're going, hey, let's look at the Harvard Business Review for the next tactics and strategies for our business. But people over profit leaders, they're leaning on the tactics that they learned in kindergarten. <laughs> to not lie, to love one another, to be kind, to share. Because we've got to remember that good morals make for great business no matter who you are, no matter when you were born, no matter what line of work you're in. But I can sense the skepticism, right? You guys are thinking, all right, man. Like, this would never work for me. You're not talking about capitalism. You're talking about a commune. <laughs> you know, I have a vision of uh, trading vegetables in the Northwest and manufacturing vegan beef jerky. <laughs> but remember that, that my philosophy is not people instead of profits. It's valuing people over profit. And my research shows that companies that value people over profit are actually more profitable. So, I want to leave you with this. Okay, we are homesick for a version of capitalism that we can trust. We're homesick for it. And business owners, I get it. I totally get it. Because the marketplace left to itself, it doesn't see people. It sees pieces of a puzzle. It sees potential purchasers. It sees zeros and dollar signs and credit card swipes and bottom lines. And every dollar our companies make is a reason not to change. Okay, because tradition, it's powerful. Pattern, it's powerful. Consistency is very powerful. Okay, but if they are stagnant, and they are deceptive, and they are only focused on profit, they could become prisons and executioners of our companies and our economy. So I'm going to leave you guys with an invitation. An invitation similar to the one that my dad made me 25 years ago. An invitation to be leaders who can break the system. An invitation to value honesty over deception. Transparency over secrecy. Authenticity over hype. And people over profit. Thank you.